I'm going to go ahead and um, get started, but while we're waiting for people to kind of trickle back, I might do a little bit of backing up. Would it be helpful to anybody to talk in a little bit more um, pragmatic, practical way about ADHD strategies before we move on? Yeah. Like, we talked about some difficulties, we talked about some global ways um, that we can be helpful as staff. Um, but uh, does anybody have some specific questions or a specific problem or a specific behavior plan example or something that they would like to start with? Uh, yes. Our, we, we do sometimes, you know, it's kind of a hard sell with teachers, I get that, but we do have some kids that, that do a lot better when testing and those kinds of things if they've got earphones on uh -huh. listening to um, appropriate music. Right. You know, something that kind of... Um, Yep. takes away a lot of the other distractions. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Why do you think uh, teachers resist that or are hesitant? Well, because it's the rule that they can't have headphones. Yep. <laughs> Rules are made to be broken. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think... That student has it. Every student walks it. Well, you yeah. know what? It's every student. Right but here's the thing. When teachers say this, what I say is we, we're here... Um, to accommodate to the individual student needs to the extent that we can, right? We all know there's a limit to that because we can't be effective teachers, you know, but, but, but if every student needed it, then every student would have it. But to some extent, that's what the IEP process is about. I mean, it's about providing those accommodations that level the playing field that provide what that student needs to access the same sort of education that their peers are. And so if that means something as simple as we're going to put headphones on them and allow them to inhibit some of that stuff that's getting in their way, hallelujah that it's that easy. And show that video to those teachers and then um, maybe it will help. I mean, that's where this empathy comes in. I mean, maybe some of that perspective taking would be helpful. Here's, here's a little bit what this experience is like for, for the student that's in your classroom. And if we can pop a pair of headphones on the student and drown out a bunch of that, then let's do it. Actually, in all fairness, the teachers at Scottsdale High School are very good about if that's what if, if that's on their IEP or that's on their 504 awesome. or whatever. They're and, and you know, the, again, I think that is something that's fairly common. And again, I, I think we all totally get it. You know, our, we have so many demands uh, on us as teachers and so many goals that we have to achieve and benchmarks we have to hit, and um, we have to do that to our best, uh, to the best extent that we can for everybody. And so we have to balance the individual needs of the student with everything else that's going on, and man, that's a tough balance. Um, so so I, totally, I totally get that hesitation. Um, the, the thing about ADHD uh, interventions in general, though, is that um, they, they do take a little bit of time and effort, but the payoff in terms of reducing classroom disruption and um, helping increase students' uh, progress are, are so enormous that it really is, you know, cost-benefit-wise, um, so helpful. And, and I think that we can get better buy-in on those strategies from all of our staff if they aren't. So if somebody talked about compassion fatigue. Who, who was that, talking about that earlier? Okay. I think this is just a huge issue um, for all of us, but especially for our, our frontline teachers and our frontline paraprofessionals because they, they, you know, they, they try the strategies and they try the strategies and they try the strategies and when they don't work and they don't work and they don't work or they work for a minute and then they don't work, who can blame them for throwing their hands up, right? <coughs> um, so we have to try to give them more effective strategies that are going to work so that they, they have reason to stay invested in it. So, um, we talked about this quick habituation. Um, what, do, what do you do about that? So say that you um, have a child who's on an IEP, other health impaired, ADHD diagnosis, there's a behavior plan, it's awesomely crafted and it talks about increasing certain behaviors in the classroom setting and it gives specific motivators, uh, reinforcers that can be earned by achieving those goals um, and you find that this child burns out super, super fast. What do you do? What, what kinds of strategies might you think of to offset that quick habituation? Yeah, that's a problem, huh? Um, I, there are a few. I mean, one 
kind of relatively simple one is a reinforcer menu. So that you don't have one specific item that you're using to reinforce, but instead you have a menu. And, and now, you still have to change it up, but you don't have to change it up quite so frequently because um, there are a number of items on it that can be earned, and so the habituation is at least slowed. So what you would do is you would do some sort of a preference assessment. If it's a very young child, you do a preference assessment by getting a whole bunch of interesting stuff together and seeing what they play with most, you know, seeing what they're most drawn to. If it's an older child, you simply sit down and talk to them about their interests and what they like and what they're into, and, um, and you build a reinforcer menu that way. And then you have this specific menu that items can be earned from. And you revamp it from time to time, but again, not as often as if there was just one reinforcer that could be earned. Um, <clears throat> another thing that you can do is some sort of token system, where the token is what's earned, and it's earned long term, but the token means something different all the time. Okay, so for example, um, I got a little ADHD guy at home. We have for a really long time used, and I will show you this particular chart. How many of you are familiar with the magic circle chart? Okay. So a magic circle chart, um, it, and I will show it to you and we'll talk about it when we talk specific strategies a little bit later on, but it is essentially a sticker chart, like any sticker chart, except periodically, randomly dispersed throughout this chart are circles, and those are the magic circles. And so what happens with um, most reinforcer programs is that if you have um, uh, a, a, a ratio of reinforcement such that every time a behavior is exhibited is reinforced at exactly the same rate, what happens? What happens when you fade back the reinforcers? What's that? Yeah, the behavior stops. The, the behavior you wanted that you've been bringing along stops. Or the behavior that you've been trying to stop returns. Either way, same, de same deal. Um, what has research shown can offset that? Intermittent reinforcement. Yeah, yeah. Random or intermittent schedules of reinforcement. Um, and so with the magic circle chart, what you can do is you can reinforce every single time a behavior occurs, but not at the same rate. So you're reinforcing verbally and with a sticker every single time the behavior is exhibited. But every time you just randomly happen to land on one of these magic, circle chart, magic circles, you're reinforcing at a higher rate. So it's, a, it's an intermittent schedule of reinforcement, which is much more um, uh, resistant to extinction as you fade it back, right? Um, and so what you can do then, uh, so, so it's good anyway, because it's more resistant to extinction. But what you can do for kids with ADHD is you can constantly be changing up what the magic circle earns. Um, and so you're using the same chart. It stays consistent. Everybody knows how to implement it. The kid is familiar with it, but what is earned by the magic circle changes. And to be even more kind of consistent yet changeable, um, what we've done for years and years and years in our house is when you hit a magic circle, um, you earn 50 cents. And that 50 cents is always the same, but what that kiddo is going to buy with it changes over time in keeping with what their interests are and what is motivating to them and what is reinforcing to them. So a lot of people are reluctant to use money as reinforcers. I'm not. Because I think money is number one super duper reinforcing to most human beings because it can buy cool stuff mm -hmm. and that cool stuff changes over time so I'm not as likely to burn out because yeah, I'm not really into Legos today but you know what, I have a sudden affinity for superhero action figures and that money will still work for those. So not as, not as likely to burn out. Plus, it teaches another skill. You earn 50 cents every time you land on a magic circle. You put it in a bank. At the end of the week, we sit down. We go through it. You count up how much you have, money counting. You decide how much you need to buy this thing you want. I mean, it, it teaches another skill, too. So I think, I think it's, you know, it's kind of win-win. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that. And then there's in the electronic information, uh, you know, there's a copy of, of what that chart looks like so that you can use it. Um, in terms of kiddos who are off-task or inattentive, the, the challenge is to build better on-task skills, uh, skills, and that's hard. Okay? So there was some really interesting research done a while back. Now it's probably been, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. And what they did is they brought a whole bunch of kids into a room, a whole bunch of kids who had been previously diagnosed with ADHD, and they ran a classroom scenario. 
and they had them complete academic tasks in there. And they had on each of their desks a counter. How many, has anybody heard me tell this story before? Harry, you probably have. Um, they had a counter on each of their desks. And as the teacher and the para circled the room, every time they would notice a child off task, inattentive, not, not following, they would deduct a point from their counter. And at the end of that designated class period, how many points you had on your counter was directly transferable to something highly motivated. So what did they find? Increase of on task. Oh, huge increase in on task behavior, right? Because there was, you talk about making a classroom like a video game, right? It was immediate feedback, immediate feedback right there in front of their little faces on how they were doing. So it increased their motivation, it increased their self-monitoring, and it allowed them to build better on-task behavior. The problem came farther in the study when as they're sitting in the classroom doing this, the kids start to notice that they're randomly losing points for no apparent reason. And what they discovered ultimately is they were in a semi-residential neighborhood and people were getting home from work and they were clicking their garage door openers, which happened to operate on the same frequency as the teacher's <laughs> remotes. And so, anyway, so you can actually order these devices um, for classroom use, but it's, it's not very practical, it's not very pragmatic. So we have explored over, year, over the years ways to sort of simulate the same effect um, in a low-tech way in a classroom setting, and we've had some pretty good success with something as simple as um, identifying what the current approximate level of on-task behavior is. So say uh, it's a 50-minute class period, and when we take baseline data, we see that um, a child has to be redirected back to task 10 times. So we say, okay, their approximate level of on-task behavior initially is five minutes. They can stay on task for five minutes. So we do a chart, a pencil and paper chart that has um, a, however many circles, right? Um, that, that correspond to those blocks of time. And, um, and they get constant, during the training period, they get like paraprofessional or assistant or volunteer, like literally they lose a circle every time they're off task or inattentive during class. And at the end of the class period, just as in the pilot study, how many circles they have left corresponds to something highly motivating. Um, so the trick of any of this is just to increase their motivation for learning periods as they build better self-monitoring to stay on task, right? Yes. So losing a circle or counter or whatever showed, I mean, that was a more positive way of doing it as opposed to giving them counters or circles? And, and it can be done either way. Um, but the way that was done in the original study is it was a loss. So it was highly, motiv highly motivating to stay on task, to avoid that loss. And there is, from time to time, controversy about, oh, this is harming the kids' self-esteem. But my take on it always is, kids with ADHD, their self-esteem is assaulted in a million and six ways every day from not being on task and from not being able to function. And us saying, ooh, you lost when you need to try better next time is by far the least of their worries. Does that make sense? Um, so if there's, a, if there's a way that makes good intuitive sense to do it the other direction, like every time I come by and you're on task, I'm going to drop a little token in your basket, I think it would probably have the same effect. It's just the immediacy of that feedback that increases their ability to self-monitor. Um, I had another thought. It was another, it was another ADHD strategy. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, the motivator. Raise your hand if you know about the motivator. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the motivator, remember pagers back in the day? Who, who remembers pagers? You guys aren't all 12, come on. So, um, a pay, so a motivator is a specific behavioral learning device um, that was designed to help increase self-monitoring to a certain behavior that we wanna change. We use them almost exclusively for kids with ADHD, but you can technically use them for any sort of high frequency behavior that you wanna alter. And the way the motivator works is you can set it for any increment of time. And when it hits that amount of time, it buzzes. It doesn't buzz, it doesn't make a sound, it vibrates. Um, it's inaudible to those people around you, but it vibrates um, and it does it at the strength that you have put into settings and the number of times that you have put into settings, and then it resets itself. 
So every time it goes off, you don't have to click it and reset it. It does it automatically. So again, kiddo that you find can only stay on task two minutes, and then they're off task again. You can set this motivator to buzz at them every three minutes, and they carry it in their pocket. And then in clinic or in school, you sit down with them and you develop a procedure and you say, okay, every time you feel this buzzing, and you practice it and you use a motivator, every time you feel this, here's what you're gonna do. And you come up with a simple procedure. So um, we have a little guy in Nature and I that we work with, and we have established, he's, he's pretty young, so we've made it pretty basic. When the motivator goes off, eyes to the teacher, locate the teacher, where is she? Um, what's he do next? Oh, freeze. Yeah, he freezes. So first one is he freezes, because he's a mover. Um, then eyes to teacher, and then back on task. So three simple, and we practice it, and we practice it, and they practice it, and we remind him, and we, um, and, and then he does it. He puts it in his little pocket, and every time he buzzes, I mean, when you're there, you can see him freeze. <laughs> back to, you know, back to task. So again, then over time, you gradually lengthen the increments as you shape this on task behavior in the right direction. Make sense? Um, let me think what else. Oh, another like real specific pragmatic thing about ADHD programming that we, I think, need to keep in mind, and this goes back to, again, that kids with ADHD tend to be a bit more concrete than you would expect from their age. Um, so uh, what we know, what we'll see a lot of times when we go to IEP meetings or talk about behavior plans is that there will be a really nice reinforcer in place, but it might be something you earn at the end of a month or that you earn at the end of a, a week even. And depending on the age of the child, that's just way too long. And you might think, well, he's 10. A week is perfectly reasonable. It should be. It should be. But again, if you think they're functioning maybe two or three years lower than that in, a, in, in, in terms of how concrete they are, it's too long. So there's something called the event horizon. Are you familiar with the event horizon from a behavioral standpoint? <clears throat> the best example I can give is this. I'm 45 now as of last week. And at 45, if I want to buy a house in three years, I can start modifying my spending behavior now, even though I won't see the reward for three years. Because at 45, my event horizon is finally that long. So there, haha, I'm you. But what we know is that as we go down in chronological age, the event horizon gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And when you get down to preschool, it's about like four hours or something like that. It's very, very short. Um, and then when you factor in impulsivity and ADHD sorts of things, it's even shorter. And so what that means is that we want to err on the side of reinforcing and consequenting immediately in shorter periods of time. Because a child will be able to tell you, if, I'm, you know, if, I, thought, if I make this behavioral goal for a week, I will get this super cool thing. And they will know it, and they will be able to tell it to you, but what's the problem with ADHD? They can't translate that into behavior. And so it won't be sufficiently, even though they know it and they know the ins and outs of that plan, it won't be sufficiently motivating if it's outside their event horizon. Questions about that? Does it make sense? Okay. Anything else in Nietzsche and Beth that you can think of that might be helpful to talk about in terms of ADHD strategy? Okay, if you have specific questions, be sure to pipe up, even if we've gone on. <laughs>